Hi, I'm Rev. Wendy Craig Purcell here at the Unity Center in San Diego. Thank you so much for watching today. If you'd like to support the work that we do here, please consider making a contribution. Go to our website. It's easy to do. Thank you in advance for that contribution. I want to talk to you today and over the next few weeks about a topic that I think is so important for us to cultivate at all times, but especially during these times. And that is the experience of stillness, deep inner stillness. I went back through some of my many, many books on the topic and pulled different kinds of ideas that I want to explore with you. I turned to a book by Ryan Holiday entitled Stillness is the Key, and I grabbed my, my old copy of Eckhart Tolle's book, Stillness Speaks, and a few others as well. And then my own experience around the journey of cultivating the inner life, because that's really what the practice of stillness is all about cultivating the inner life so that we can deal with the outer life with greater ease and greater consciousness and clarity and with greater wisdom, I think. In his book, uh, Stillness is a Key, Ryan Holiday writes about the idea of stillness across a variety of domains, stillness of the mind, stillness of the body, stillness of the spirit, and stillness of the heart. So we're going to explore all of these ideas. And they're not new ideas. They're really not. And what is so, what is so revealing, I think, is when we begin to explore spiritual principles and ideas and we trace their roots we see how far back they go. You know, we can study the Greek philosophers, the Stoic philosophers. We can study the teachings of Confucius, the teachings of Gautama Buddha, we find the teachings in the Old Testament, and we find that spiritual truth echoes in all of these places. And in so many, many ways, as human beings, we are still grappling with some of the same things. How do we live lives of meaning and purpose? How do we uh, be kinder and, and more gentle? And how do we create successful lives? Why bother with this idea of stillness is what I want to talk to you about today. The Greek philosopher Epictetus, who he was a Stoic philosopher, he lived about 55 AD to 135 AD. And so that means that he was living very much during the time of the early days of Christianity, the followers of the way, the followers of, of Jesus' teachings. And he was known as, he, he stood for the common brotherhood of man. And listen to what he said as a divine idea, as, a, as an ideal. He said, the struggle is great, but the task divine to gain mastery, freedom, happiness, and tranquility. To gain mastery, freedom, happiness, and tranquility. Can't we agree that we want those same things ourselves today? Mastery, freedom, tranquility, happiness. The Roman philosopher Seneca complained about the noisiness of, the, of the, the world around him. And he lived basically during the same time period, the noisiness of the world around him. And he wrote, it said to, to a friend, complaining about how he couldn't concentrate because of the noise of the vendors outside where, where he lived and where he worked, the sounds of carpenters, of children playing, of the noise in, in the, the shopping stalls, of, of just the noise of athletes in the gymnasium, that it was so loud that he found that it was hard to concentrate. And when I get a picture of that, I think, boy, some of us would probably like to be able to live life right now with a mute button, right? Where any time it gets a little too chaotic, a little too loud, a little too noisy, we can just hit that mute button. Well, this is what Seneca wrote as he was complaining about the noise, and this is back then. This is back then. He wrote to a friend, it is not enough. It's, excuse me, it's enough to make me hate my very powers of hearing, but I have toughened my nerves against all that sort of thing. I force my mind to concentrate 
and keep it from straying to things outside itself. All outdoors may be bedlam, provided that there is no disturbance within. All outdoors may be bedlam, provided that there is no disturbance within. You may be sure that you are at peace with yourself when no noise reaches you, when no word shakes you out of yourself, whether it be flattery or a threat or merely an empty sound buzzing about you. It reminds me of a, a much-loved affirmation in unity. I am centered in the awareness of God's presence, and nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. I am centered in the awareness of God's presence, and nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. It's an affirmation worth committing to memory and really using when we find ourselves being thrown off center because of the noise and the chaos around us to take a deep breath in and affirm for ourselves, I am centered in the presence of spirit and the presence of God and nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. The importance of mastering this inner state of stillness of calmness, of tranquility, is echoed in the wisdom traditions of all of the world, of all of the world. Confucius spoke about it in 500 BC. The Buddhists have a word for it. It was upeka, which means equanimity. The Hebrews have a word for it, hishtavut, which also means tranquility or equanimity, stillness. The Bhagavad Gita speaks of it as samavatman, an evenness of the mind, a peace that is ever the same. We've already talked about some of the Greek Stoic philosophers. And in English, today, in our day and age, we call it stillness. When you hear that word, stillness, what comes to your mind? Is there an image? <clears throat> Is there a feeling? Is there a memory? Stillness. What comes to your mind? When I speak the word stillness, when I think of stillness, what comes to my mind is the surface of a lake where there had been ripples on the lake, maybe from, from the wind or from a duck swimming across the lake or a boat leaving a wake. And then after that duck moves or the wind becomes more quiet or the boat has moved far away, over time, the surface of that lake becomes ever so still. And in that stillness, I can look deep down and see far and clear. And in that stillness, there is also a reflection I can see myself. Stillness. When we experience and cultivate that inner state, we can see more deeply into ourselves and more clearly into ourselves, and we can reflect more fully and completely that divine spark that resides in every single one of us, regardless of, of what we call it, regardless of whether we believe in it or not. It's there because we are made of the same essence, God and essence, stardust, whatever you want to call it. If we were to Google, and I did in preparation for this series, how many books are out there now on the subject of stillness? I just want to read a very short and very partial list to you. Stillness Speaks by Eckhart Tolle, Strength and Stillness by Bob Roth, The Art of Stillness by Pico Iyer, Strength and Stillness, A Message of Women by Patricia Holland, Stillness, A Guide to Finding Your Inner Peace by Joseph Kaufman, The Ever Space, Utilizing the Power of God and Neuroscience to Create Stillness Within by Christopher Kitawaski, The Stillness of the Living Forest, A Year of Listening and Learning by John Harvey, The Way of Baseball, Finding Stillness at 95 Miles an Hour by Sean Green. The Power of Stillness, Learn Meditation in 30 Days by Tobin Blake. From Stress to Stillness, Tools for Inner Peace by Gina Lake. And on and on and on. And so when, when we can trace this 
this idea of stillness or equanimity or tranquility, the many different names this state is often referred to, when we can trace its roots so far back and people are still talking about it and writing books that we are buying and reading, don't you think it's because it's something really valuable? Don't you think it's because it's something that we need to pay attention to? I don't know how it is for you, but I'm finding that I am needing to hold on ever more steadily and consistently to my spiritual practice in order to be able to find my way through the noise and the chaos and the anger and some of the downright meanness that is going on in our, in our country, in our world today. So why bother? Why bother cultivating stillness? There are three things I want to talk about today. Because we live in a noisy world, that's why. Secondly, because it is possible to live better, saner, healthier, more loving lives. That's number two. And number three, because we need clearer minds, steadier hands, and more loving hearts in our world today. So let's look at that first one a little bit more. Why bother? Why bother? Because we do live in a noisier world. It is more chaotic. The pace is faster today than at any other time in human history. We are experiencing a bombardment of nonstop information and input from all sources. Do you remember when the only inbox you had was the physical inbox on your physical desk? I remember that. And now how many inboxes do you have? Now how many email accounts do you have? How many places and people and organizations are you following and do you get notifications for? How many tweets do you get a day? How many times do you get pinged? Now our devices even report back to us how much time we're spending in front of those, those screens. Some of it I think is certainly valuable. Some of it can be very helpful. Some of it can make us be more productive and more effective around things that matter. But without paying attention, it can become too much too fast to where we have forgotten how to unplug. I love that Anne Lamott quote where she says, most everything in life will work better if you unplug it every once in a while, even you. And boy, is that true. And to unplug, if we haven't unplugged for a while, if we have gotten so used to the constant bombardment of the phone ringing or our texts going off or emails coming in, if we have gotten so accustomed to that, the very act of beginning to dial it back can feel very, very strange, almost like quitting drinking or smoking or any other addiction, cold turkey. We've, we can feel that, right? But nonetheless, there is a great price that we are paying if we neglect the inner life. There is a great price we are paying individually, in our families, and in our societies if we are neglecting the inner life. Ryan Holiday writes, To be steady while the world spins around you, to act without frenzy, to hear only what needs to be heard, to possess quietude, exterior and interior, on command. That is what we are going for. I like these words from Ellen DeGeneres. I get those fle fleeting, beautiful moments of inner peace and stillness. And then the other 23 hours and 45 minutes of the day, I'm a human trying to make it through in this world. Do you ever feel like that? You know... Our meditation time, which is a, a prime time for many of us to get familiar with the feeling of stillness and to cultivate it and to practice it, it's not meant to just be that isolated 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever period of time we sit in our meditation chair and then we're done. The whole purpose of that is not what happens in that chunk of time. It's how that chunk of time rewires us, rewires 
our minds and our very hearts, our very souls, so that then when we're in the other 23 hours and 45 minutes of the day, we can be in it differently. It's about, I think, turning down life's volume. Eckhart Tolle said, the equivalent of external noise is the inner noise of thinking. The equivalent of external silence is inner stillness. So the second idea, why bother? When we learn to cultivate this inner state of stillness, we will, we will live better, saner, healthier, more more joyful lives. Who wouldn't want more of that, right? Wouldn't you like to be living a better, saner, healthier, more joy-filled life? Of course you would, and so would I. When we get better at at inner stillness, we will find that we can think more clearly. We can make better decisions. We can make those tough decisions with greater confidence. When we have become better at cultivating inner stillness, we will find that we can manage our our emotions better. Our flare-ups, our anger, our frustration will be dialed back. We will find it easier to build and to sustain good habits. We will find that probably our blood pressure goes down and every other healthy sign goes up. We will find that our relationships are more peaceful and better. I was, as I was doing what I usually do on Saturday, which is to prepare my Sunday notebook and and look back over the ideas and reflect on my week. As I was thinking about these ideas of stillness, I couldn't help but see the many Buddhas that I have in my house. I have a Buddha in my dining room. I have two Buddhas in my family room. I have a, a beautiful Buddha in my living room. I have a Kuan Yin in, in our entryway. I have a Buddha or two, I think, up, upstairs as well. And what, what I found myself reflecting on is every single Buddha statue I have The Buddha's eyes are closed. I don't know if there exists a Buddha statue with the Buddha's eyes open, but every single statue, the Buddha's eyes are closed, and there's this image of stillness, this expression of tranquility. And what came to me so clearly is, yes, because the Buddha is meditating, of course, and looking within and practicing stillness, but I don't believe it was done to escape life or escape the world, but rather to be able to emerge out of that state stronger and clearer and more able to deal with whatever had to be dealt with. That's what I want. And when I think about our spiritual community, when I think about my family, when I think about the people I love, that's what I want for them too. Because when we can cultivate and get better at this state of being, then it ripples out and touches every other aspect of our lives. Ryan Holiday writes, It's not New Age mumbo-jumbo. This idea... This idea of stillness is not some soft New Age nonsense or the domain of monks and sages, but in fact, desperately necessary to all of us, whether we're running a hedge fund or playing in the Super Bowl, pioneering research in a new field, or raising a family. It's an attainable path to enlightenment and excellence, greatness and happiness, performance as well as presence for every kind of person. Stillness is what aims the archer's arrow. It inspires new ideas. It sharpens perspective and illuminates connections. It slows a ball down so that we might hit it. It generates a vision, helps us resist the passions of the mob, makes space for gratitude and wonder. Stillness allows us to persevere, to succeed. It is the key that unlocks the insights of genius and allows us regular folks to understand them. To echo back on one of the quotes I read at the beginning of our service from Leonard Bernstein, he talked about the idea that 
every idea, every invention, every great initiative comes out of that space of stillness, out of that space of silence, and then it is informed by action. Then we give it life. It is the Buddha opening its eyes and doing its work, whatever its work may be, out in the world. Why bother? Number three, because we need clearer minds. We desperately need steadier hands. And we need loving hearts to improve our lives and to make this a better world. Clearer minds, steadier hands, more loving hearts. Let me ask you this. In a moment of frustration, of anger, of anxiety, do you make good decisions? I know I don't. I know my mind is not clear. It's as if that that lake's water is as agitated as it possibly could be, more like the surface of a jacuzzi, than a still, calm lake. We need clearer minds so that we can make good decisions for ourselves, for our lives, for our families, for who we put in office, for the work that we say yes to, for the issues that we stand solidly in and for, for the courage to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. We need clearer minds, steadier hands, and a more loving heart. When I think of steady hands, I think of how many times I have prayed with somebody before going into surgery. And almost without exception, part of my prayer always includes that the surgeon and the medical team have clear minds and very steady hands so that whatever decisions they make are coming from the greatest level of skill that they have and that their hands are steady to be able to do whatever needs to be done with skill and with precision. Holiday writes, while the magnitude and urgency of our struggle is modern, it is rooted in a timeless problem. Indeed, history shows that the ability to cultivate quiet and quell the turmoil inside us, to slow the mind down, to understand our emotions and to conquer our bodies, has always been extremely difficult. He quotes Pascal, who said in 1654, all of humanity's problems stem stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I want to encourage you as you think about this lesson and this idea of cultivating stillness for yourself. I want to invite you to think about where in your life can you begin to turn the volume down a little bit. And I'm not speaking of the volume of sound as much as I am the volume of the chaos around you. Where can you turn it down a bit? Where do you need to find a mute button? Where do you need to be able to Step back, be by yourself in a room alone with your thoughts. When do you need to experience that Buddha face, if you will, of closing your eyes gently, not to escape, but to be able to turn within to find the wisdom, the power, the peace, the strength and tranquility that does reside in you so that you can experience that and then emerge with your eyes wide open, with your mind clear, with your hands steady, and with a loving heart to do whatever is yours today. Nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. I am centered in the awareness of God's presence. Nothing can disturb the calm peace of my soul. Namaste. Namaste.